I want you to open your Bibles with me, please, to Romans chapter 8. If you know me well, I like to utilize my time carefully, allowing the Lord to have his way. Romans chapter 8. Find your way at verse 26 to 28. A familiar text that I'm going to read from the NIV version. Verse 26 says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with with the will of God. Final verse for the evening. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So far the scripture. Father, bless your word afresh. May it come alive again in our spirit. Open our hearts to be receptive to your word and our ears to hear your word. Our mind to comprehend your word and a zealousness to live your word. For this we are grateful in Jesus' name. Let the body of Christ say. Amen. Take your seats please and look at someone and say these words to them. Define good. Look at somebody else and tell them I need your definition of good. I suggest tonight, now two nights, this first night, that the act of human nature and immediate response when our ears hear the verbiage good, our mind comprehend the word good on the level of which we are. What is interesting is it is an immediate calculation in this finite mind that I'm going to like whatever it is that's coming behind it because the word good is prefacing it. One hears good, one automatically thinks that I am going to like it. Look at somebody and say good. Do I hear music or is it just me? Okay, hold on to music for me for a minute. Thank you so kindly. If I hear good, I think that that is something that's going to be palatable for me to take in. What is about to happen will make me feel good, meaning I'm going to smile after it. I'm going to skip and rejoice because good prefaced it. I am going to feel every ounce of good emotion because good is in front of the works. May I suggest to you that in doing or defining good, usually we see it as something we approve. Why? Because it's good. In most concepts, the concept of good denotes a conduct that should be preferred, something you should want, something you should invite. And to think of good is to think of everything being, again I repeat, palatable. Thinking of good thinks of it admirable. Thinking of good thinks pleasing. And you think of more than mediocre, you think super. But we might ask yourself the question, what exactly is good in comparison to God? Because if you say good and you think palatable, you don't think, and I'm going to use an American medicine, it might be here, you don't think castor oil. Is castor oil here? Because if you use, and your parents when you were ill and they gave you castor oil, you would look at it and set your face. Because the immediate taste of the castor oil is not good. But the result of allowing the castor oil to get into your body will give you a good result but it didn't taste good in the beginning consider something else we have in America called Buckley's 
Buckley's almost has the smell of ammonia. Yet it is used for the decongestion of the chest when the mucus has increased and it's very difficult for you to breathe. When Buckley's gets in in its immediate, it is not nice. It doesn't even smell good. However, after Buckley's has worked itself in the system, within 24 hours or less, you are back up on your feet. But it wasn't good to begin with, but they said it was good. Therefore, it almost becomes an oxymoron because it's bad, but it's good. If there are definitions to consider as good, then what do we do with better? If good is in a place of high standard, then where do you put better in comparison to good? God never, nowhere in the scripture did it say God was better. It said God is good which indicated also the other text said that oh, there is no one that is good, only God. They never said better, which indicates there is a different definition in the mindset of God where good is concerned versus where the mindset of humanity defines good. Because if good is defined as admirable, pleasing, superior, positive, and quality, and palatable, then why would the text of Psalm 119 and 71 say, David opens his mouth and says, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I may learn your decrees. How in the world does good and afflicted end up in the same sentence? It would not make sense. It was good for me to be afflicted. If using the definition I started with, I would say it was pleasurable, admirable, palatable, exciting, joyful, and I can't wait for the next time that I get beaten up. But the text is saying it not only was good for me to be afflicted, it is using affliction as a result of what I went through that has made me better. So here the text then tells me something else as I set the groundwork here, that the Hebrew word for affliction here means brow beaten. It means troubled, it means abased, it means chastened, it means defiled, it means hurt, it means weakened, it means depressed. So if you reinterpret the text, it was good, admirable, palatable, nice, great, that I had been depressed, humble, chastened, weakened, and bow beaten. Now I'm trying to figure out what in the world is God talking about? Because when you put this meaning into the verse, suddenly it could be reading something else. If you take time to look at the text, it's good for me that I was browbeaten. Because then I learned your statutes. It was good that I had not put my confidence in people. I had not learned how to trust people, but I learned how to trust you. It was good that I had a hard time and the people I was expecting to support me and support you did not support you so that when your praise went up, it would only go up to God and not to people. It was good. It was good. You begin to acknowledge that the Lord uses affliction, listen, for his good. For whatever you go through, it is never ever about you. It is always about how God would get glory out of it after you had been through it. Now the text tells us not only was it good for the affliction, but it reminds us that we are hard pressed on every side. That we are crushed, and but not come crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not 
lose heart. Though outwardly our wasting away takes place, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. In spite of what I might have to deal with, because I am so hooked up with God, I am being renewed and regenerated and revived and vigor is coming back into my system because ultimately I cannot be destroyed. Why? Because it is working for my good all of the above is working out to grow me to develop me to move me to my next level one of the primary values of our age is that suffering is a bad thing why have we defined suffering to mean god no longer likes us if hell is breaking loose in your life, everybody in the church says you must have done something wrong with God. It's the same thing they did with Job. Job in the first chapter is defined as a perfect and upright man. And just as he goes through losing the wife, losing the children, losing the money, losing the land, everybody and the so-called no good friends turn and say to him, you must have done something wrong for you to go through all of this. If that be the case, then what it is that Jesus did that he ended up on a cross? If that be the case, what did he say that would have angered the father that would put him there? There is nothing wrong with a moment of suffering. Physical pain and suffering must be eliminated at all costs in the mindset of humanity. We will do anything that it takes to remove pain from our lives. Yes, we would if we could find the mechanism to remove anything that would cause us a hard day, we would get rid of it because in our mindset, we want every day to be a sunshine day. Yes, we do. Look at your name and say he's telling the truth. Every day we would, wish, we would wish the sun would shine. Every day we would wish the clouds would never appear. Every day we would wish that we have all the money we would like in our pockets. Every day we would wish that we would never have a cold, never have a fever, never have a back biting, never have somebody stab us behind the back and betray us. We would wish that that never existed. But if you live with that mentality, you would never experience the power of the God you say you serve. If you live with that mentality, you would never realize how powerful your God is. Every day will not be good and part of your journey has to do with falling. Oh, what do you mean? You got to fall in order to learn how to walk. When the child first comes out of the womb, the child does not come out of the womb walking. The child comes out and needs to be lifted into the hand of an adult. And then after a while it keeps growing, you put it on the floor. It sits in one place for a while. Then it starts to move when it realizes it has some agility. Next thing you know, it starts to crawl. After it rolls first and then it starts crawling. It's realizing there's more to the body than what the person thought. And then one day that child begins to walk. And that child then begins to realize these legs are used for more than just crawling. But at some point when he or she begins to walk, they would fall. They're going to fall one or two or three times. The worst thing you could do is run behind the child when the child falls and brush off the knees and make them feel like falling is not real. You've got to allow the child to fall. Allow the child to bruise up the knees. Allow the child to walk and play in the street and come back and get a few straps here and there. Anybody in this building from the, let me see here, from the knee down to the ankle, if I ask to look at your section of your body, if there are no scratches somewhere on your leg, 
You have not lived a good childhood. I'm almost to the medium of where I'm going. You haven't lived. I need to see some scars on your leg. I need to know that you were having a real childhood. You jumped on a bicycle at some point. Oh, come on, church. You were down on your knees, what we used to do, play skelly and marbles, and you were having a good time in the street. You came home with uniforms, gotten struck, cut up, and you, Ma, I don't know what happened, but the pants got torn. What do you mean? I sent you to school. How did the pants get torn? You know how it got torn. You were playing. You weren't going home straight. Don't look at me like you holier than thou. You were doing stuff. Look at somebody and say, you were doing stuff. There's got to be some scrapes. There's got to be some scars. But when you fall, you've got to know you can get up. Tell your neighbor, it's time to get up. Oh, let's try it again. Look at somebody and say, it's time to get up. Tell them it's time to get up and it's a part of life. Falling is a part of life. Yes, it is. Scraping your knees is a part of life. Going through hard times is a part of life. We see pain, we see affliction, we see suffering as enemies to the be vanquished from our life. We see emotional pain as approach as the same way. I don't want anybody to hurt my heart. I don't want any to break anybody to break my feelings. I don't want anybody to make me feel bad. If you don't want your heart broken, you better stop praying for a relationship. Ooh, you really think every relationship is wonderful, pretty, and going along with no ups and downs? Every relationship has some bumps along the journey. Every relationship has some times when husband and wife are not necessarily liking each other. Don't sit there and act like they don't know what I'm talking about. Have them pretty marriages. Things are always working well. There are days I'm not interested in talking to Delicia. There are days Delicia doesn't want to see Eric. And there are days the two of us are, see you, see you too. I'm out, me too. And you keep it going. But you learn when there is true love, there's got to be some pain. Oh, I, I'm almost to my middle. When there's true love, there's got to be some not liking each other. When there's true love, there has to be some disagreements because you both have two different mindsets. If you're sitting next to your husband and your wife looking, to, just tell them, listen tonight, listen. <laughs> the real understanding of emotional pain being part of our lives is because we have not taught people that it is okay to feel bad before you feel good. There is some truth in our gut reaction to pain and suffering. It is not the way it was supposed to be because it only came as a result of the fall in the garden. Whatever it was supposed to be different, we don't know. We only know it came, I repeat, as a result that Adam did not have a check on his wife. It only came as a result that he allowed his wife to have an affair with another man. Oh, you're looking at me strange on that note. He did. The fact that the Satan was able to get up in her ears. Where are you, Adam, was the question God asked. Why were you not protecting your property? Why were you not making sure that another man could not slip in and talk to your woman while I was in your presence and you were supposed to be in mine? It is obvious something else was supposed to take place and you messed it up. But as a result, God comes back and tell us, before you go any further, I know how to set the thing straight. You have to go through pain. You got to go through suffering. You got to go through the challenges. But there's more to life than what you think. Because Psalm 119 and 67 said, before I was afflicted, I went to straight. But now I keep your word. I learned, in other words, how to pray because I had been afflicted. I learned how to fast because I had been afflicted. I learned how to grow in the Lord because I had been afflicted. I learned how to praise God and dance up and down the aisles because of the things I have been through. It is because of what I have been through 
that I have become better and good is better than good. I say to you, good is better than better because my afflictions did not kill me. The afflictions did not destroy me. The afflictions did not take me out. The text uses Psalm 105 and 18 and says, where it says, Joseph's feet was hurt when he was put in irons. But Joseph still mounted and became a great leader at the end of the day. His brothers put him in a carriage and sold and put him in the dungeon and sold him on the way from a pit and still Joseph came out at the end of the day David's brothers became jealous of him also and still David would say I, I had been afflicted by the wicked but God was on my side perhaps striking the note better is when God puts himself in the form of Jesus and Jesus is betrayed by Judas and still Jesus rises above the betrayal and the affliction what about you what about me why can't we learn to be strong why are we so weak that we fall out by everything that doesn't seem to go well why do we quit so easily we just jump up and say I'm done with God when God was good to you according to your definition of good you are praising him like there was no tomorrow money in your pocket God is good bills paid God is good roof over your head God is good a Mercedes and a Ferragamo, a Ferragamo to work with God is good everything that you wanted you said God was good but now that affliction has showed up now that trouble has presented itself now that a hard day is now in your midst where is the sound of your voice that would say God is good God has to be good when hell is breaking loose. God has to be good when no money is in your pocket. God has to be good when the bills are higher than your income. God has to be good when you're about to be evicted. God is good in spite of and regardless of. Look at somebody and shout, define good. Sit down to your feet. Don't make me nervous. I'm almost there. <laughs> Afflictions is part of the style. Suffering is meant to drive you away from sin and closer to God. Yes, it is. Affliction teaches you God's ways. Yes, it does. Affliction is meant to drive us to the word of God. Yes, it does, because when you're going through, you start searching to find out why you're going through what you're going through. Don't look for God's word to come from heaven when it is sitting in your shelf. Stop waiting for God to just drop down on your situation when your Bible is sitting right there on your table. Why has your Bible become an ornament in your house? Why has your Bible become a bookshelf on the bookshelf gathering dust? At what point do you not break the book and start listening to the book and see what the book says concerning your life, knowing that God's got your life in the palm of his hand. Suffering comes from the hand of God and it's part of his faithfulness to us. It's when we understand the psalmist that God is sovereign in our suffering. God is sovereign in our affliction. God is sovereign when a disturbing news takes place. When mama and daddy dies, God is still good. When the child doesn't finish school and turn out to what you want them to be, God is still good good why because of the goodness of God in the declaring that every
everything is going to work out for his good. There is a purpose as to why one child is excelling and the other child is not. You think that there is a curse on the child that is not. You have no idea as to why that child is going through that particular journey. Have you thought for a quick minute that maybe you need that child in your life to keep you straight with God? If all of your children was doing perfectly well, there is the possibility of thinking you are then that you got it all together and you alone and God are the best of friends and everybody else has got it wrong. There are things that God is going to put in our lives that would allow us to learn how to come closer to him. That child has made you learn how to pray. That child has made you develop more patience than you thought you had. That child has brought you closer to God because that child has made you get to the voice and to the faith and to the altar of God. My brothers and my sisters, affliction is part of the good and being good comes with affliction. There's a plowing in the field. The Lord would crucify our hearts so that we would come closer to him. The Bible tells us it was good that I had been afflicted. Therefore, whatever I go through is as a result that you're working something on my behalf. All this proves that affliction is a mighty advantage. Look at somebody and say, affliction is a mighty advantage. Stop seeing affliction as a negative. See affliction as that which will propel you to your next level. See affliction as that which will develop your maturity. See affliction as that which will take you to a place you could never go on your own. You got to learn how to say it was good for me to be afflicted it was palatable it didn't taste good in the beginning it did not feel good when it was happening i did not know if i liked god when i was going through it i didn't feel like coming to church when hell was happening around me i don't know that i wanted to bring my tithes and my offerings because it seemed like the opposite to what i should have been experiencing but I found out after I went through it that it made me so much that I can give a testimony. I can tell somebody I know what it is to live a year without a job. But I watch God provide every single day like I still had a job. Because I went through, I can tell somebody I know what it is to live on a hospital bed and the doctor said I would not live but because I trusted God it was not good in the beginning but now I have a testimony tell somebody quickly we are overcomers by our testimony I can tell you God is good look at two folks and tell them God is good how do you know he's good I'm still alive how do you know he's good I'm still in my right mind how do you know he's good I have not lost my hope how do you know he's good I still have a praise in my soul how do you know he's good? Because a child went to prison, but the child is still alive. How do you know he's good? Because my daughter got pregnant, but I did not lose my daughter. It brought us closer together. How do you know he's good? Because everything that I've been through, I can still stand up. I can still hold my head because he said he will keep me in perfect peace he whose mind is stayed on him I found out something else 
and we know that all things are working out for his good. I didn't know why. I didn't understand how. But everything that I was going through, God was working it out for the good. And the Bible says that when good is in the midst, it's going to find me. That's why David said, surely, I think you got it now. Surely, surely, goodness and mercy is going to follow me every day of my life. Goodness is looking for me. Tell three people, goodness is looking for you. Goodness is searching you down. Goodness is showing up because it's going to bring glory to my God. It's going to bless my God. God works for the good of those who love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. And because I love him, I'm going to go through. But because I love him, it's going to work itself out. Give somebody a high five and tell them it's going to work itself out. It's going to be all right. It's good. I'm glad that some people did what they did. I'm glad that some people backstabbed. I'm glad that some people did not help me. I'm glad that some people didn't show up because if they did show up, I wouldn't be able to be here giving God glory. So I praise God that it worked out for my good. It's working out because it is according to the purpose of God. It's part of my purpose. It's part of my purpose. It's part of my purpose. I'm going to say it again. It's part of my purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, it's part of your purpose. It's part of your journey. You were supposed to lose money when you lost money because God had a ram in the thicket that Jehovah Jireh was ready to provide. But if you always had money, you will never know how good your God is. Tell somebody he's good. He's good. That's why the Bible says, and I close, there is no one good but God. Nobody can take care of me like God can take care of me. Nobody can take care of my body like God can take care of my body. Nobody can keep food on my table like God can keep food on my table. I'm so glad. Open up your mouth and say, I'm so glad. My God is good. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Define good. And when you do define good, do not define it like Webster Dictionary and the Encyclopedia. Do not define it like what Google says it is. Define it according to the word of God. Stop being upset with God because the deal didn't work out. He was working it for your good. He knows that if you had signed a contract with that particular group, they will cheat you at the end and you did not see it in the beginning. 
And later on, you turn around and say, it was good that I did not sign that contract. God has not and will not and never shall forget his people. So don't, again I repeat, blame the devil for everything. Stop giving him all this credit. You call his name too much. Don't you know that when you call Eric, I am going to respond. Because that is what? My name. So every time you call his name, he responds. Even when he knows he's not the one that did what you're blaming him for. Praise him, thank you. Come to the top. Don't you know that he sits back so often and he says, I did not do that. That same God they get up there praising, that God that they keep giving money to is the one that put them through that and here they are blaming me. <laughs> and every one of us has been guilty about that. Not knowing it was working because it was part of of the purpose. I've learned how to sit back and realize even for those who have not yet bore children, we open your womb tonight in the name of Jesus. We declare your womb shall bring forth a child in the name of Jesus. But may I also say to you that you were not supposed to have the child until God said so. Because we often say that, no, I'm not going to have a child before I reach 30-something and 40-something and I'm going to have a child. Ask Sarah about that. She wanted one too, but she didn't get it until she was way up in the 90s. And God still did it. Why? Because it was working out for their good. It was part of the purpose. I tell people all the time, Bishop, the father... Both of my children, same father, same mother. But the father that Darian experienced is not the father, Lady Neela, that Brianna is experiencing. Because when I had Darian, I was still in my immaturity, Pastor Van Wern. I was just learning marriage. I was 27, trying to figure this whole thing out. See, y'all got this thing perfectly figured out. God bless you. I didn't have it figured out. I was trying to figure it out. How does this work? We need pampers. I need a shoe. We need milk. I want a shirt. And if you know anything about me who love clothes, it was a problem for Lady Garns and I to deal with this situation. Because she wanted me to stop shopping because we had a child. And I couldn't figure it out. But it was good that I had been through that challenge of life. Because by the time Brianna came, I had another level of maturity. I understood sacrifice when you bring a child into the world. You cannot do the same things you were doing before the child came. The child did not ask to be here. You two enjoyed an evening of blessings. You figure that out when you go home. And there came the child. It was good that you had been through so that you are more mature to handle today. Here's my last point on this. It was good that I had been afflicted is what the scripture says over Sianino. Because I have been afflicted, I can testify on the stage. No disrespect to anybody. But if you haven't been through some stuff in life, you really have no right ministering to people. And if you think that because I was raised and born in the church that I didn't go through some stuff, you have a, ma a bad mistake about what life is all about. I was literally birthed in the church. But I did not know Jesus although I was born in the church. They raised me in the church. I never knew the Lord until I was about 10 or 11 years old. That's when I started 
understanding what salvation was all about. And even at that point, your, your testimony is different than mine, but even at that point, when college came, oh, hallelujah, God bless you, hallelujah. It's called you feel your oats. You're no longer on the mother and father's house. I'm out. But it was good that I went through all of that because it made me be able to now minister to those coming behind me and say to them, you're going to scrape your knees on your own, but this part you don't have to scrape. Stretch out your hands before God. I want you to return tomorrow. I want you to repeat this after me before I make this declaration and say, God, Thank you for every troubled moment. Thank you for every deal that didn't go well. Thank you for every afflicted situation. Thank you for the job that I thought I was supposed to have. But you had something better because it was good that I had been rejected. Now, God, receive my praise. Receive my worship. Receive, oh God, my heart and my mind. That I would now take on a new definition of the definition of good. That God is good. Even when it doesn't look like he is. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, give God a hand clap. Tomorrow night will be our last night. I'm going to overwork you, but I want to do something tonight. I want you to know in the midst of all that everyone has been through and will go through the plans that he has for you they are ah you got it quickly they are good and it might not feel like it's working out but I promise you on the word of God it's working out I love God and I love his word and I challenge you tonight to step out on his word. The pastor that felt like quitting, stop thinking about that. Stand your post. Hold your ground. God's got you. I don't know who I'm talking to. I said, the pastor that thought about quitting, stop thinking like that. Hold your ground. God's got you. I'm going to ask every pastor tonight to step out by faith. I'm going to ask every business person to step out by faith. And some of you are going to join what they're doing. But many of you, I want to step out by faith for Siloam. And I want to ask you for 500 rand. Did he say 500? Yes, I did. I did. I want you to make a sacrifice of 500 rand. Every pastor. You can EFT it also. Is that, is that what y'all use, EFT? Okay, I learned it quick. We use cash up and venue. I want you to come out here though. I want you to come out here. I, want you to, I need you to come out here quickly. Every pastor, come on, quickly, quickly. Because even if you're not a part of this house, when you're having something, you want something. I want you to step out here, every one of you. Thank you. Come on, look at that. Look at God's people. Business person, step out here right now. Some of you can do a thousand rand. It's nothing. Come on, come on, come on. Look at God, look at God. Come on and give God praise for God's people up in here. Come on, come on, come on. If the Lord leads you to a thousand, don't listen to the 500. I don't play those games and stand up here longer. I need you to be honest with integrity. With integrity. There's a reason I'm coming. I'm here. I'm standing over you tonight. There's a reason I'm standing here. I'm in agreement with you. That what you are looking for God to do is already done. And their seed is going to open up the doors. They're still coming. Look at God's people. They're still coming. Come on, they're still coming. The rest of you that got it, you got it, you got it. Come on. Come on. 
Earlier, Pastor Reynolds spoke about what? The gift of giving. The gift of giving. The year has just begun. We're into the second month now. Your profit and loss statement is going to be in a whole different ball game. It's now time for your finances in a different ball game. 2020, 2024, no time for shenanigans and no time for game playing. Guess what? It will be one of the best years you have ever experienced. It will be. Where are the business owners? Raise your hands. Let me see who the business owners. Raise your hands. Raise your hands high so I can see who you are. We honor you. We honor you. But God is honoring you way beyond me because you are giving in the house of God. Your givings go to a whole nother level than those who are in the employment of nine to five. Because to whom much is given, much is required. If he can trust you with your business, that means he trusts you with more to come. You can step out with a thousand rand, do that. Look at God's people. Give God, people, give God a praise for those who are standing up here. And I'm not looking for any untruth. Stretch out your offerings. Stretch out. This is how the Lord lead me for tonight. Tomorrow's our last night. And I don't know how God works. Got something else that I want to do. But I know what I know I'm supposed to do tonight. As your hands are up. Y'all get ready to give too. Even if you're not 500, get ready to give. Even if you're playing, you're going to give. Stop playing and pick up the EFT and give. Hallelujah. Yeah, you're good musician. Y'all do that. Y'all go playing. Everybody else giving and they ain't giving. Lift it high. Lift it high. Thank you for what you're doing. If you're with your spouse, hold on to your spouse. If you're standing next to somebody else, put your money and your hand next to each other quickly. I speak to your finances tonight. That the good that is in your hand is going to multiply way beyond the means of your mindset. The good that is in your hand, you are putting it in good ground. This is good ground. Siloam is good ground. And when you sow seed, he gives seed to the sower. Which means as long as you keep sowing seed, you are going to keep getting seed back on the continuous it is automatic according to his word. Father, in Jesus' name, every soul that stands here with an envelope, they're standing here, oh God, obedient to the word of God, that you are good and that your mercy endures forever. Now God, as the business, if it is challenged, flip the script and blow a wind in their direction. And may their profits be way beyond their expectations. Whatever their numbers were for 2023, double, triple, and quadruple it for 2024. We honor you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We honor you. As pastors, may the tithes and the offerings increase in their churches. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may every bill be met every vision be manifested may there be no lack within that house in the mighty name of Jesus and for this we thank you now in Jesus name let the body of Christ say put your offering on the altar just drop it on the altar quickly drop it on the altar as you drop it just say God is good as you drop it if you're doing it electronically Make your, your electronic device touch the altar. Now here, the rest of you, you are a part of God's blessings. Get an offering in your hand quickly, an 100 rand, a 50 rand, something, and I need you to come up here fast. Come on, the rest of you, come on, quickly, quickly. If you were not in the first given, I need you to get an offering. Come quickly, come quickly. I don't take long with offering. Make your way up here and sow your seed. Come here, sir. Give me your hand. Just because of your quickness, I hear the Holy Ghost clearly say, it's touch and agree with you for what you want in your quickness. May the God of heaven show up way beyond your expectation in Jesus' name. Come on. Every one of you, every one of you, do you all need to come and give? If you need to step out and then come back, do that too. 
Hallelujah. Look at God's people coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Yes. Together. Is working together, together for my good, for my 